Um, I'd like to thank uh, Lorraine and the rest of the team here for inviting me along today to speak to you about what is a really rather emotive subject. Graffiti is a very emotive subject, and that's sort of echoed by the numbers here in this audience today and the uh, diverse accounts, narratives and opinions that we've been hearing. My job is really quite simple. I'm a copper. I am paid to look after uh, people, that is people's lives and people's property here in London. And um, when I was on the graffiti squad before it was disbanded a couple of years ago, that's, that's the squad I worked on, um, that's exactly what we did. We looked out for Londoners. I don't make any apologies for what we did. I thought we did a good job. And I hope that Londoners um, would echo that, uh, that opinion and that sentiment. Today, what I'm going to talk to you about is the realities of graffiti. It has some very, very negative and unintended consequences. And I'll lead you into that in a little bit. Um, what is graffiti? Well, let's have a look at it. To put it in context, it's often said in the popular press, particularly the red tops, that graffiti writers, they're referred to as vandals generally, they're mindless. That, ladies and gentlemen, in my experience, is the last thing that they are. They are not mindless vandals. They're pretty well organised. They know what they're up to. They're adept. They're cunning. Um, they set out, when they go out on their graffiti missions, with very set objectives in the mind. They're out to do as much damage as they can, and they want to do it without getting caught, obviously, and, and hurt or killed. All of these quotes are from academics or people involved in the graffiti subculture. Hugo Martin is, will be familiar to some here in the audience. Uh, audience. Um, he said, uh, graffiti is only ever graffiti when it's done illegally. And um, if it's on a legal venue, then it ceases to be graffiti. There's a difference. There is the, the stark difference. If it's done in an illegal setting, then it's graffiti. If it's in a legal setting, you can call it street art or urban art or whichever label you want to apply to it. But the second, if you think of the second leg, that's generally nothing to do with the police, whereas the first leg we do get concerned about. This is a quote by one of the most prolific and um, within the subculture, dare I say, well thought of graffiti writers. This is back in about 1990, 1991, he said this. Uh, well, in fact, it's 97. Um, the, uh, the only proper writers are on trains. That's where it belongs. That's what this particular writer said. He's a guy here from London. Um, and what he's echoing, really, there is the, uh, the, uh, the culture that really kind of grew out and popularised out of New York around the end of the 60s and the early 70s. Over there in New York, around about then, although graffiti wasn't, I would argue, in, invented in New York, I would say it was, a, I'd argue, it was invented in, in Philly, by the time it migrated to New York in 68, 69, wherever it was, it, it became a competition in the five boroughs. And quickly, very quickly, they, they ran out of uh, space above ground and they, they, they identified trains as being um, another canvas. And that canvas is a canvas that moves in New York from far out in, this, in, in, the, in the countryside right into the heart of the city. And it's mirrored here in London. If you look at the Met Line, which is the, one of the preferred lines for graffiti writers here in, the, in London, the Met Line goes from way out to Watford, right into the heart of the city of Oldgate. And, um, you know, that travelling canvas is uh, a way of exposing what they do to a wider audience. That's why they go after trains. Also, the buzz is doing it is, uh, is another factor because it's so dangerous getting into train yards, particularly these days. So, uh, the ethos of graffiti. Well, the prime directive is, is getting up. And what we mean by that is it's actually going out day after day, night after night, and saturating an area with your tag name. Um, and as it says up there, style is a, a secondary concern. It's the first concern is getting up. And as young writers become better at what they do, more emboldened and confident, then of course style becomes another feature of what they're getting up to because they want to be known for having good hand style. You've heard that term used here today, hand style is, is how they represent their, uh, their tag and uh, what they do. Consequently, only someone with a very determined sense of vocation is going to be um, up for going out night after night after night in all kinds of weather conditions to, uh, to hit up um, around the city or in, uh, in the train yards. And the practice is rooted in bombing. And that, I would argue, goes straight back to Philly in 67 
when, uh, for many commentators, uh, the writer uh, Cornbread um, developed that sort of ethos of saturating an area. In, in that case, it was his home city of Philly. There's an interesting story around this. Um, he was a, a, young, a young lad, um, and he was trying to capture the attention of a particular young female. So he wrote his tag name, Cornbread, everywhere. And uh, eventually, um, his, his intention was, of course, to capture this girl's attention. And eventually, he did. Um, but because he was so into bombing, she lost interest in him. Um, so the unintended consequence of his graffiti activities was he lost the heart of the girl he was trying to so desperately win. There we go. So graffiti, I, 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 I can't get away from this. Graffiti is a competition. And when I'm talking to people, that there are people no doubt in this audience who are writers and will understand what I'm talking about. It's, it's an internal and an external competition. And the way I like to sort of describe it is like this. If you think about golf, whether you go out on your own or with your partners, you know, two, four ball, whatever, you're always trying to do, when you're playing your shots, you're trying to play the, the very best shot you, as you can because you want to get down that particular green in as few shots as possible. That's, that's the idea of, uh, of golf, isn't it? It's the same with graffiti writers. When they, want to, when they go out, they want to do you know, the best graffiti that they can. They may have to do it very quickly, but they're still interested in doing as much and as best as they can. So it's a big competition, and they compete for space, particularly public spaces, because that's where the public get to see what they do. There's no point uh, painting graffiti in somebody's attic. Who's going to see it there? No one. Um, prolificity. You know, you've, you've heard um, Mr. Judd here today say he did 2.5 million uh, pounds worth of damage. That is a huge amount of, uh, of work that's gone into producing that kind of damage. Style. Nobody wants to be known as having a weak hand style. But it's a uh, fame. This is, this is one of the principal motives for graffiti writers, in my experience. It's fame from a name. So once they've developed their tag, uh, the, or the letters they want to use, then it's go out, saturate the area, um, and try and get fame from that name. And labels, they compete for labels. Now, some of the labels that they compete for, you've probably heard of them here today, Toy, Writer, King. These are all bound into the old city movement. And you can see, here in London, there's, there's thousands of writers absolutely thousands of them. Across the UK, there's probably tens of thousands. And the principal focus, as I said, is to write on trains. So we've done a, a survey, so a couple of years ago now, but we identified 287 known train writers. A further 172 that we didn't um, know, that is, we didn't know who they were, what their real names were, of which 41 were um, foreign nationals, and they originated from 20 different countries. And London is the economic, the beating heart of the UK, and this is where they come to. And the reason, one of the, one of the reasons they come here, not just because they want to be tourists or stuff like that, um, is because we have such a wide variety of um, transportation systems. We've got overground trains, underground trains, we've got tram systems, you know, there's a whole bunch of different transportation systems, plus the, the, uh, um, the bus networks. These are all steel. That's what they're going after. You know, you heard Mr. Judd saying he was a member of a graffiti crew. His graffiti crew was ATS, addicted to steel. That's what they were into, bashing up steel. That's what I police. My job is to stop and do it, try and protect their lives as well. But London is a tourist trap. People come here from around the world, not just to experience London and all it has to offer, but they also come here as graffiti writers from across the world. We get writers here from Australia and all kinds of things, and they come here just to bash up our trains, take some photographs, and go home and tell them it's what they got up to. We've heard about the Broken Windows theory. I am I, I'm a disciple of it. I, 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 have, I know there's, there's those that disagree, and there's lots of voices that dissent and disagree with the theory, but I happen to agree with it. I personally, my own experience, do think it leads to antisocial behaviour, other types of more serious crime and urban decay. Um, that's my, that's my, perfect, my personal opinion. Um, but it can also, on the railways, create a climate um, of fear for those who work there. Some of the messages, and you guys don't get to see them because it's, it's got rid of it pretty quickly, but some of the messages that are left are really quite offensive. Not very nice things at all. And here's a figure. This is a current figure, um, and it is up to date. This is currently what it's costing uh, to uh, deal with graffiti, just on the railways. Um, more historic figures. 
Um, I think the last survey, a uh, big survey, was around about 2005. Maybe, maybe Lorraine will correct me, but it was around about then. And uh, there, were, there were suggestions, you know, back around about then, it was costing up to a billion pounds a year across the UK. These are phenomenal figures, you know. We could probably build loads and loads of hospitals and stuff with that kind of money. Anyway, I'm going to take a step back in time now, because it is back in the noughties when, or the mid-noughties, when um, we, were, we were receiving such a volume of complaints, um, not just from the train operators and Network Rail and TfL and stuff like that, but from right across London, it, there, was, there was a huge noise in terms of complaints. Um, to the extent that um, in, in March 2006, um, the problem had become so significant that we had to do something about it. So what we did was we, we set up a, a policing operation. It was a huge task force at the height of its powers. I think there was 45 um, police officers and police staff engaged in the operation. And um, the crew that uh, we identified um, as being uh, the most destructive at that particular time, others may argue otherwise, but I thought they were the most destructive, was the DPM crew, the Don't Push Me crew, based loosely um, around sort of southeast London. So uh, we, uh, we did the investigation like uh, you'd expect us to, and in June 2006 we arrested 10 people. Um, we focused our attention on investigating 120 graffiti offences. These were principally against trains, but there were um, also some train stations, trackside walls and people's homes, people's cars, people's white vans and, and stuff like that. There was, they, were, they were into everything, this guy, these guys. The total cost of the damage that was attributed to them was um, about a half a million pounds. And um, by November the next year, um, nine men had been charged with a conspiracy to cause criminal damage. And this really, for us in the police service, was another step change in our attitude and the way we policed up um, graffiti. Whereas before, we would uh, uh, deal with them for what they were caught doing, that is, if they were caught tagging a wall or whatever it was, we would deal with them for that. The step change had to occur. We, we had to t sort of grasp this problem really quite, uh, quite properly by the horns. And um, rather than dealing with them for a straightforward criminal damage offence or maybe a joint venture, the step change came with the conspiracy to cause criminal damage. For those of you that don't know, the difference is criminal damage is damaging somebody else's property without their permission with the intention of causing that damage. That's pretty much in a nutshell. Whereas conspiracy, by contrast, the crime is committed as soon as you agree to do it. Whether or not you do it is really immaterial. As soon as you agree with somebody else that that's what you're off to do, the crime is committed. And it's viewed very seriously by the courts. Of course, we, the police, don't make the decision to prosecute people. It's our decision to investigate based on a complaint, but it's not our decision to prosecute. That decision rests solely with the Crown Prosecution Service here in England and Wales. They are uh, the guys that make that decision, not us. Quite independent of the police service, they decided that uh, the DPM crew were going to be charged with uh, conspiracy. And on the 8th of uh, July, 2008, uh, members of the crew appeared for Southwark Crown Court, just over in London Bridge. And um, between them, they were sentenced to a total of 11 and a half years imprisonment. And again, that was another step change in criminal justice here in the UK. Um, those kinds of sentences had never been handed out before. And regardless of your uh, personal opinions uh, on whether that is too harsh or whether it's right for graffiti writers to be sent to jail for a property-related offence, again... Yes, thank you. Um, the sentence of a court lies solely with the judge. This game has nothing to do with the police. It's, it is a matter for the judge based on his own judgment, and that's what the judge in this case decided. So that's the first case, the case study. Um, it just goes to show kind of that particular crew based here in London, they were operating right across London and the southeast, but it goes to show just how much damage they did over a uh, a period of about, I don't know, nine or ten years, I guess, they were in operation. Um, to my mind and my knowledge, um, I think they've, uh, they've knocked it on the air. They do kind of legal work now, but that's about it. The second one, um, investigation, again, it was another crew-based investigation, but a, a slightly um, different context to it. Um, 
this, this really sort of demonstrates the, the idea of the all-city individual movements and how it can be sort of developed, worked upon from a sort of a, uh, the perspective of a, a graffiti writer's criminal career. For graffiti writers, the idea is to be as prolific and as prominent as possible, so they go to all different neighbourhoods around the city and, uh, and get up. And once you've gone kind of um, all city, then you move off to the next town or the next city and you keep going and you keep bashing up until you've gone all country and indeed then the next step is to jump across the water and, and start hitting up in Europe and further afield. And this is what this crew did. This is the GSD crew and uh, the GOAT squad. Um, the members of, the t of that particular crew that uh, we dealt with, um, they were all in their own rights very well thought of graffiti writers um, and they were inducted into this crew from, from other crews that were based around the country, like a sort of a kind of a, like a super crew. And uh, they really kind of did specialise in going right around the world um, as graffiti tourists using like the sort of embedded structures and organisations in the graffiti tourism, in, uh, sorry, in the tourism industry to become graffiti tourists. So a long investigation. Um, which uh, identified five persons that uh, were arrested in connection with um, nearly 200 offences um, in 24 different countries. And this gives you a show, uh, just the next slide will just give you a demonstration to show you just how prolific they were. They really did get around the world. Um, they were travelling absolutely everywhere to get their graffiti up. And these are just the countries that I knew about. There, there probably are loads of others that I never found out about. So. Uh, Total damage there that um, they faced when they got to court was just under £600,000. And in, um, they were again charged with conspiracy. And uh, in uh, January of last uh, year, oh, sorry, excuse me, yeah, January last year, uh, they appeared before Blackfriars Crown Court just across the road. And again, they were sentenced to um, 11 years imprisonment. You'll note that uh, there's a sort of a parity between those two crews in terms of what uh, the judges handed out, and that's because the DPM crew, when they were sentenced, they, they took their sentence to the appeal court. They said they were harshly treated, and they appealed their sentences, and um, it went up to the Royal Courts of Justice, and the appeal court judges said, no, um, the judge got it right, and it became a kind of a, a, a case, a, a stated case, as we call it. Um, so it kind of set the bar at a particular level, and the GST crew, they passed that level as well, unfortunately, and they, they were also sentenced to prison. Now, I would argue that um, those kinds of sentences um, have a deterrent effect, which is what the judges always say, because they are bound to take deterrence into consideration when they are passing their judgments. And the knock-on effect is um, people stop doing graffiti damage. Um, and it was, it was right after the DPM uh, case, some writers just quit. They told me, that's it, I'm done, I'm, I'm out of the game. Others radically changed the way they operated. Um, the GSD is an example of that. Rather than doing the volume of damage they were doing in, uh, in the UK, they decided to go abroad. Other countries have different attitudes to graffiti than we have here in the UK. And graffiti di uh, crime is down. Um, that's the, one of the jobs of the police. We are here to investigate crime, to solve it if we can. 